All right, so today, uh, basically today and uh, this week, I want to talk about something we were originally going to do in lab. So, and that originally my plan was to have you guys to build a micro, uh, Michelson interferometer, like the, what the experiment you talked about in modern physics. We're obviously not going to be able to do that now, but we could talk about some of uh, the theory and applications of Michelson interferometers. Some of them you know, in particular, it's part of the famous Michelson-Morley experiment for modern physics. Uh, but there are some other uh, applications that they're still used in labs uh, around the world today for a variety of things. So we're going to talk about that. What I uh, want to point out, or at least ask you, uh, is that this involves kind of a lectures or the lecture here is somewhat in depth and it's going to take some time and I'd like to use one of the lab section one of the lab times uh, to go through some of this material uh, in particular I like to do that this week so during our normal lab time tomorrow I'd like to meet and do some uh, do some of this material then so hopefully everyone is still free between uh, Basically, I think we need an hour tomorrow, starting at 1.30. Would that be okay with everyone? All right. If, if, you have, if you have a problem where you can't connect during our lab time, hopefully you don't have any other classes during that time now or anything, I'd like to meet tomorrow for about an hour just to talk about some of this theory. So make a note about that tomorrow at 1.30. Uh, we're going to meet to do some of the Michelson interferometer stuff. Since it's technically a lab material, we'll talk about it during our lab period. Okay, any questions on that? So today we'll talk about Michelson interferometer. Tomorrow, starting at 1.30, we'll talk for about an hour, and then uh, our normal class Wednesday. Okay, uh, so basically the main goal here is for the next few weeks we wanna talk, we've talked a lot about geometrical optics. Before that we discussed polarization. And before that we discussed general like optical properties of materials, where the index of refraction comes from and how it affects light. Now I want to go back and focus for the next few weeks on the actual wave properties of light. And in particular, properties that you've seen in intro and modern physics, the fact that light can interfere. And this is also connected to the fact that light will diffract. And you've seen in several experiments at this point in your physics career that a light that interferes with another light source can produce constructive and destructive interference producing bright and dark fringes on some screen, which you can use to measure, for instance, the wavelength of light or some other properties that we might care about. Uh, the famous example where you guys have heard of this is in the Michelson interferometer, where the, these bright and dark constructive and destructive fringes are used to effectively measure the speed of light. And we're going to talk about that uh, tomorrow. Today, we're gonna to focus on kind of the set, this general idea and the general theory behind how these fringes come out of the interferometer. So that's our goal for today. Uh, this picture is courtesy of the, of the internet. Uh, when I post these slides later on, you'll have the uh, link to the webpage where I got this from. But as you can see here, the basic idea of a Michelson interferometer is that we have a light source that hits a beam splitter and it's split into two paths. One path goes along one direction, the other path goes along a perpendicular direction and they hit two mirrors. The two beams are then recombined by the beam splitter and hit a detector together where they interfere, producing usually a circular fringe pattern like shown here. We're going to show today why that fringe pattern kind of looks like this and how this inter where interference comes from. So to see where interference comes from, Let's go back and look at our formula for the irradiance or the intensity of light. So if we have two light waves, assume they're both plane waves. So they're proportional to this exponent to the 
i k x minus omega t or i k dot r if we're in three dimensions. Our radiance is going to be is proportional to the electric field of those light waves squared. So if we just have one light wave, our radiance is going to be the electric field. And if we represent, we use this complex notation for waves, the square of this electric field will be the electric field times its complex conjugate. That will ensure that we give the real part, get the real part of uh, the electric field and square that. Essentially, the analogy here uh, to quantum mechanics is that the electric field is kind of like our wave function if we write it in complex notation, and the intensity is like our probability density. So since the electric field is a vector, this square is a dot product. So if we write out the dot product explicitly in terms of components, it looks like this. We discussed this somewhat during the beginning of the semester when we first talked about irradiance. Now I want to see what happens if we have two different light sources that both overlap at a point and we calculate the total irradiance. As we're going to see, this total irradiance or intensity is going to depend on the light polarization, the color, the relative colors or frequencies of the two light sources. So let's see why this is. Let's take a first case and let's say that we have different polarizations. So we have one laser beam, for instance, polarized along the x direction and one laser beam polarized along the y direction. This is kind of, this is the easy case here. This is where we just apply, where we apply this formula twice, once for the x component, once for the y component. For one source, for the x component wave, the intensity will only have this term. For the y component wave, the intensity will only have this term. So when we add together the intensities of the two light sources, we get this. And basically what this says is that if we have different polarizations, then the two, the intensities of the two laser beams just add directly. It's nice and easy like that. So that's kind of fairly straightforward. Things get a little more complicated if we have two light sources or two laser beams that have the same polarization and are hitting the same point. And the reason why this is more complicated is because all of a sudden, now let's say both laser beams are polarized along the x direction. So the total electric field in the x direction is going to be the electric field of light wave one plus the electric field of light wave two. And this makes our dot product a little bit more complicated. Let me quickly just uh, reset the slide here. So this dot product, ex dot with its complex conjugate, if we write this out explicitly, what this is going to look like is going to be E1 plus E2 dotted with that. That's an E. E1 complex conjugate plus E2 complex conjugate. So if we're polarized entirely along the x direction, these terms are zero. But this term looks like that. And that makes computing the intensity but a little bit more difficult because we got all this foiling to do. But let's go ahead and do that. So here we could say instead of the, for the same polarizations, instead of the intensities adding, it's the fields that add together. So let's kind of take this and foil it out. So our total intensity in this case is going to look like this. We have E1 squared, E1, E1 star, plus E2 squared, E2, E2 star, E2 times this complex conjugate. This term here can be written 
can be simplified in terms of uh, using some uh, algebra of complex numbers. And I'm going to do that on the next line. So this thing here is equal to two times the real part of E1 times E2 complex conjugate. And now we see the difference from last time. So here, the first term, E1, E1 star, this is our total intensity of light wave one. E2, E2 star is our total intensity of light wave or laser beam two. But now that they're the same polarization because of this foiling algebra, we get this thing called a cross term. And this thing changes the physics quite drastically. This is what yields interference. Sometimes this cross term is going to be negative and equal in magnitude to I1 plus I2. And it cancels out those intensities. And that would represent a dark fringe. That would be a position where we have a dark fringe. Other points, E, this term here will be large and positive, in which case we'll get even brighter intensity than we would if the two beams weren't interfering. And that would represent a bright fringe. So I know you guys have talked about in modern physics, interference like, the, like for instance, in the double slit experiment or in the Michelson-Morley experiment, using complex numbers in the way we're representing waves in this class, this is how interference is represented mathematically. It's this cross term between the electric, electric field of light source one and electric field of light source two. So mathematically, this is where interference comes from. And determining where, if you wanna know where a dark fringe is, you have to determine where this is equal to minus I1 minus I2. If you want a bright fringe, you determine where this is positive and maximum. Any questions on the kind of theory here? And we're talking about things that you guys have seen before, uh, but kind of using new mathematical language. Okay, so let's see kind of, kind of separate example. Let's see what kind of interference we get if we have two laser beams, but they're different colors. Let's say one is uh, red and one is blue. And here, fortunately, the wave numbers and the frequencies are different. So we have to compute the, because of that, we have to compute the irradiance directly from the pointing vector. Remember from earlier in the class in the semester that the irradiance is effectively the average of this quantity, the pointing vector, which was proportional to E cross B, the electric field and magnetic field of our light, light wave. So we have to do this, uh, the magnitude, so the maximum magnitude of the pointing vector is gonna be E total plus times B total. So we're gonna add the electric fields of both of our waves together, the red light source and the blue light source and the magnetic fields and work this out. Doing our foiling here, we get something that looks like this. So notice we have terms E1, V1, and E2, B2. We can rewrite the magnetic field. Remember the magnetic field in a light wave is always equal to the electric field in the light wave divided by C. So we could use that result to rewrite these terms to become the intensity of our wave. So a C will cancel with a C here and we'll get an E squared, E1 squared here. And we'll get an E2 squared here. So these, the first and fourth terms are the intensities of our red. First one is the intensity of our red laser beam. The second term is the intensity of our blue laser beam. The two terms in the middle are our cross terms that should give rise to interference or would give rise to interference. 
Let's take a look at those more closely. Uh, on the next line here, I'm going to write out these in terms of, on this slide, I'm going to write out E and B in terms of sines and cosines rather than complex numbers. And uh, to compute the average, we're going to have to do an integral. So I'm going to have like an integral on the next slide, but don't really worry about copying it down because we're not actually going to have to work out the integral. It's one of those integrals that we, we could argue is going to be zero. So just fair warning there. Uh, don't worry about having to copy it down. So now let's consider, let's look at this first term, E1 times, so the electric field of the red light source times the magnetic field of the blue light source. Writing these out in terms of sines and cosines, we might have something like this. So they have different wave numbers and frequencies because they're different colors. They might also be out of phase or in phase, so they have different phase constants in general. So if we want to compute the, the average intensity, it's going to be proportional to this integral over time. So we have to integrate over a large time, and then we might do infinity, minus infinity to infinity, or we could do integrate over the period of a wave and divide by that period. But this integral here, so the amplitudes are, of the two light sources are constant. So we're gonna pull those out of the integral. And then we have the integral of these two cosine terms. From here, however, if you look at this integral, and this is the same integral from the bottom of the last slide, but here, uh, just kind of leaving more room. If we just kind of graph these two functions, since they have different frequencies, they're going to go in and out of phase with time. Sometimes they'll overlap, sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll overlap and give a big negative peak. Uh, but they're about, depending on how often they are, they're in phase as often as they're out of phase. And on average, so remember this integral computes an average. On average, this integral is zero. And you probably proved something like this uh, in, maybe in Calc 2, you had to do an integral of a cosine of x, cosine of y. There's only, if the frequencies of the two cosine waves are different, the integral over time ends up being zero. So it's something you've probably seen in the past, even if you don't remember the full details of the calculation. Here, I'm not gonna re-derive it, but we're just gonna use this fact to kind of say that basically both of these cross terms for different colors of light average out to zero, meaning that for different colors, there is no interference. So if you want to see interference fringes, constructive or destructive interference, you're only going to see that with two light sources that have the same color or the same frequency. If they're different colors, the interference cancels out, basically because this integral averages, or this sum here averages to zero, and this product averages to zero. All of the cross terms on average are zero, so for different colors, we get no interference. So again, I'm not going through that full calculation here today in class, but hopefully this like graphical argument kind of makes sense to you. And experimentally, it's what we see. If we want to see interference of two light sources, you can never see bright and dark fringes of a red laser when it overlaps with a blue laser. You can only see uh, interference when you have uh, when you have a light source of one color. So just to kind of summarize this idea here, if you have different polarizations or the polarizations of the two sources are perpendicular, you get no interference. If you have different colors, you get no interference. 
And similarly, if you have both of those things, you get no interference. It, only when you have the same polarization and the same color that this cross term that gives rise to interference is not zero. So in this chapter, kind of in this part of the course, we're only going to consider this situation, same polarization, same color. So let's see what happens here where we take two beams, they're all along the line. And we, try to, we want to try to actually compute what this cross term is. So we have two beams, both have, so we have I1 and I2. Both beams have intensity I1 and I2. We're going to say those intensities are equal. So I1 plus I2, they're both equal to I0. So you could add these together to get two I0. And then we're going to take these beams. They're going to be along a line. And they're going to hit some target. The only difference is we're going to make for instance, we could imagine taking, making these two light sources by like taking a laser beam in lab and using a beam splitter to split it into two, which is, tech, which is what you do with a Michelson interferometer. So these two light sources have the exact same frequency, except we're going to have one arrive at a slightly, arrive at the detector at a slightly later time. So one beam we delay by this time tau. So the first beam gets to the detector at a time t. The second beam gets to the detector at a later time. So as you can see, the reason when the beam gets there at a later time, it introduces a phase shift between the two waves. So because of this time delay, a crest might not overlap with a, with a crest. Depending on the time delay, if a crest overlaps with a trough, we're going to get destructive interference and our screen will be dark. If tau here is equal to a multiple of the period of our light wave, then a crest will overlap with a crest and we'll get a big bright spot on our screen. And that would because of constructive interference. So this time delay adds in the phase shift that gives us interference. And in this kind of simplified scenario where they're both hitting the screen dead on at the same angle, the whole screen is either going to be bright or dark, depending on this time delay. This is what we call fringes in delay. Instead of like fringes in space, like you've seen in lab in the past here, the screen will be either bright or dark, depending on how much we delay one of these beams. So it's kind of like a somewhat simplified example. So we can kind of simplify this uh, multiplication in here, cross out terms that cancel. And so we see the cross term simplifies to depend just on the exponential of that delay time. So our change in intensity depends on the delay time. If we get this time to make this whole term equal to zero, our intensity will just be two I naught. We could pick a time such that this is equal to minus two I naught and get destructive interference. Or we could pick a time that makes this equal to, makes this a maximum and get a bright fringe where we're brighter than two I naught. So simplifying a bit, taking the real part of this, we see that we vary, if we vary this delay time, the total intensity we get varies as the cosine of that delay time, or the cosine of the light frequency times that delay time. So that, the point here is that in this simplified example, the overall intensity depends on the relative delay between these two beams. 
this term here using the definition of intensity. We can rewrite that as two times I naught. If you go back to how intensity was defined, it's equal to one half C times permittivity times E squared. So this is what you might call this simplified experiment where the two beams are along a line is a simpler version of the Michelson-Morley experiment. But really, you just see this bright spot on a screen or a dark spot. And then as you vary this delay time, it goes up, down, up. So you get screen gets bright, screen gets dark, screen gets bright, screen gets dark screen gets bright. And it varies as a sine or cos as a cosine wave. Is that clear to everyone? Does that make sense what we're talking about here? So the takeaway message is that we vary uh, we vary the time delay between the two beams. We vary their, their relative phase shift, and it allows us to control whether they constructively or destructively interfere. And that dependence is a cosine dependence. So how can we do this experimentally? So we can imagine, for instance, you know, having a laser beam come in, having one of those laser beams that are interfering, hitting a mirror that we could move. So for instance here, I'm drawing the laser beams as a pulse just so you can kind of see it. Uh, but this works well even if you have like constant intensity laser beams, it works just as well. So we could kind of delay this mirror, move the mirror back in space and delay the arrival of that second beam uh, by some by a time tau, and that time tau will be proportional to how far we move the mirror back. So in fact, just using like the speed of light, so if we move the mirror distance delta l, that beam, the path that beam has to travel is all of a sudden has to travel two delta l longer distance than the other beam. Using the speed of light to convert to the time, we can figure out. Uh, we can figure out how far we need to move this mirror to get a time delay of tau, whatever time delay we want. And in interferometers in labs, this is generally how it's done. This is called, uh, in an optics lab, a delay line. And it's, you could build one with one mirror, uh, there, but there's other reasons why you might want to more complicate ones where you build one with two mirrors. And all the optical companies make uh, translation stages with stepper motors that allow you to really do fine-tuned movements of the mirror position by fractions of a micron. So if you wanted to take this and compute the phase delay, remember the phase delay is going to be frequency times the delay time. So the phase corresponding to a shift of two delta L be 2k times delta l, where k is the wave number of the wave, 2 pi divided by the wavelength. So for some numbers here, just to see how far, uh, how, how much control we could have over this in a lab, uh, the speed of light is, in units of microns per picosecond, is 300 microns per picosecond. So if we move a mirror, if we're able to displace a mirror by one micrometer, that allows us to uh, slow down a wave by you know, billions, trillions of a second. So here, one micron corresponds to about three femtoseconds, which is about almost one period of a wave for uh, light at near infrared frequency. So you really can, this experiment we described can be done in a lab you can generate these constructive and destructive interference and really slow down a light source by 
one period of a light wave, which is really, really cool. Uh, the fact that one, all you need is a stepper motor to move a micron. And these things, it is capable to make a stage where you could have a motor move a mirror exactly by just one micron. It's really neat. So these, of course, come about naturally too. But for instance, here's like a picture of such a stage that you could buy from Thor Labs. I looked this up this morning on their website. Here, this one is made from uh, two different mirrors. So for instance, a beam comes in here. Here and here you might have iris apertures where you, so you can align your beam in and out. And these two mirrors are set up in what's called a retro reflector situation. So it reflects the beam out at the same angle it comes in at and then puts the beam out along the same line. So the idea here is that it's as if the beam went straight, but it takes this, it goes along this delayed path. If we wanted to interfere this beam with another beam, we might have the second beam just move straight through. So this is often how this is set up in a lab. These mirrors would be on a stage here that's connected to one of these uh, very fine stepper motors. As a picture of what these things look like from Thor Labs. So here, this box here is a, uh, in order to get this system in a lab, this, this whole thing is the stepper motor stage. This thing here is, the con is a control box for the stepper motor, which, would kind of, which kind of hooks up to the computer. I have one of these systems in my lab using for a different application, but uh, basically, most of this is just hardware and a control box to control the mechanical hardware. The actual optics are just right here on this movable part of the stage. So if we zoom in on that movable part of the stage, you can see here are the two mirrors that retro reflect the beam. And this guy in the front here, this is a movable iris aperture that you can, very small one that you can move in and out to kind of align the beam in place and really get the beam uh, directly. It's a nice system. It's pretty cool. It uh, also costs about $4,000. So you pay for what you get. But we're going to talk about the applications of why you would want to do this in a lab over the coming days. But I just want to show you that this experiment we're describing can actually be done. So moving forward with this idea that we can move this mirror, uh, the original Michelson interferometer did not have a movable mirror. It just had two equal path lamp beams. But the applications of the device become, we get many more applications for the Michelson interferometer if we allow us the ability to move one of these mirrors. So let's take the Michelson more, Morley experiment and build it again. So we have a light source coming in. We're going to assume it's a red laser in this case. Might be, it could be any color, but as long as it's monochromatic. Here the vectors are in red, so let's assume it's a red laser. And we come in with an input beam and then hits a beam splitter, which splits the beam into two paths, which reflect the back together and brings the beam back together over here at this position on a screen, where we measure total output intensity on the screen. If we can control the delay here of, of this second of this L1 beam by moving the mirror, we can delay one pulse relative to the other and get this fringes and delay effect, where we get a bright, large bright spot or a large dark spot on the screen, depending on the mirror position. So here, this uh, theory that we put together two slides ago applies directly to this experiment. The only thing that's different here is the minus sign, and that's because when the light hits the mirror here, uh, upon reflection from a mirror, the phase of the wave shifts. So the electric field that's pointing upwards, you know, towards our face, let's say, after reflection will point downwards. So you get a uh, half wave phase shift off of the reflection, and that causes this to become a minus sign. So that's the only difference here. <laughs>
here delta L will be equal to L2 minus L1, the change in the difference in path length between our two beams. So we'd end up getting, we could build this graph uh, systematically changing the, uh, the mirror position to change delta L. And here I've written the cosine not in terms of frequency times tau, but I've switched, uh, I've used our phase shift formula to write it in terms of wave number delta L. So we could tell whether we'll have a bright or dark spot on the screen just by systematically changing delta L, we could produce this graph. So this is often uh, how, this is how, for instance, the uh, Michelson interfer interferometer can actually be used to measure the wavelength of light. And doing experiments like this is how we know those wavelength numbers. So how we know green is like 530 nanometers and red is 600 and 30 something nanometers. We know that because the space between, the delay between uh, constructive interference and destructive interference, or between two deconstructive interference positions is about, is the wavelength divided by two based on this formula over here because K is equal to two pi divided by the wavelength. So interferometers like the Michelson interferometer can be used to measure the wavelength of light and different light sources very, very accurately and precisely. And this is how we know those numbers. You can also uh, use this to kind of, you can play some tricks. Uh, and we're not gonna talk about this much mathematically, but even if we had like, Back in Michelson and Morley's day, uh, lasers didn't exist. So they really only had access to white light sources that had multiple uh, different frequencies of light. And they played some tricks so that they could still see constructive and destructive interference. And basically the trick they played was to make sure that the second, that the beams traveled through the same amount of glass on both arms. So in one arm, it travels through the uh, beam splitter glass three times, and the other arm only once. So by adding in the second plate of glass, it ensures that the light source passes through, on both beams passes through the same amount of glass. And what this does is it makes it so that the different uh, phases of the different colors all line up so that the cross terms in the interference equation don't cancel out. It's a pretty neat little slick trick, but in the modern day, we have access to very nice one color monochromatic light sources, so we don't really need to do this. But just as a historical note, uh, if you ever read up on the, the history of the Michelson-Morley experiment, they'll have this thing called a compensator plate, and that was why. The last thing I want to talk about is how we get fringes in space. So if you've ever, if you've seen the result of the Michelson-Morley experiment, uh, you get fringes on the screen uh, spread out in space, kind of like you would get from a uh, uh, double slit experiment. And that was kind of what I showed on the first slide in class today. And the, the way this happens, instead of getting either one big bright constructive spot or one big dark constructive spot, you can get this fringe effect in space where you have bright fringe, dark fringe, bright fringe, dark fringe, so on and so forth, by setting up your interferometer such that the two beams hit at a slight angle. And this allows what this does is it means the K vectors of the two way, even though the frequencies are the same, the K vectors are slightly different. And basically there, if we let the Z direction be the direction of propagation and the X direction to be the perpendicular direction, 
the k vectors, the x component of the k vectors differ by a minus sign. So when we compute the overall total electric field that hits the screen, wave one, if we write out k dot r explicitly, will look like this with a plus sign. For the second wave, k dot r will look exactly the same but with a minus sign. If we go through trying to simplify, doing a lot of algebra, rearranging, uh, so we could uh, pull out the ikz cosine and the omega t term exponentials from both of these terms, bring them all out front. And then our total electric field ends up having this whole extra term due to the angle between the two incoming beams. We could actually rewrite that as a cosine. Cosine kx times sine of theta. So it's a cosine of the sine of the angle our two beams come in at. So this is our total electric field. Our intensity is proportional to the electric field squared. So if we square everything here, if we square this guy, we multiply by its complex conjugate, so it cancels out. But this guy gives us a cosine squared. This guy gives us 4 i naught. So we see the intensity is a function of x, that is a function of position along the screen, ends up varying like a cosine squared function. which we could write, rewrite using a trigonometry, using a trig identity kind of like so. And basically the spacing between the fringes can be determined by the numbers inside of this cosine. So the fringe spacing is going to be everything multiplied by x, everything multiplying x inside this cosine. So k is 2 pi divided by the wavelength. And that allows us to uh, kind of take this formula and rewrite it in terms of the wavelength. So the spacing between the fringes will depend both on the angle between the beams and the wavelength of light. The bigger the wavelength, the, far more, the farther apart the fringes will be spaced. So the Michelson-Morley experiment is easier to do and see the results of if you're working with larger wavelength light. However, you'll see here that the sign of this angle theta between our two incoming beams appears in the denominator. So the more, uh, the larger this angle, the more clo the closer our fringes are. So you really need this angle, you need these beams to be, you need this angle to be small. So you need the beams to be almost in line but just a slight angle between them. If the angle's too big, the fringes get so close together that you can't see the effect. This is a lot of trigonometry, and I suspect this is hard to go over on the internet, but hopefully, uh, hopefully the basics and like the physical principles make sense. By putting this angle in between our two beams, we could see a fringe pattern along the screen, not just one bright or dark fringe, but a whole set of them. And that's all because adding in this angle changes the components of the K vector for the two beams, such that, uh, such that it changes the intensity like so. It gives it this dependence on X. This is kind of more of one of those like derivations I'm going to show you. I'm not going to expect you to repeat this work. Though for understanding the Michelson-Morley experiment, this result here is the critical thing. Any questions at this point? We're almost done for today. <laughs>
So the last thing I want to talk about is how we modify the Michelson interferometer to get these spatial fringes, which is actually what Michelson and Morley did. They wanted to see fringes like this because it's easier to see how something like this changes rather than one bright spot or one dark spot. So here, now if we delay one of our beams with that movable mirror, what will happen is we'll see something like this. So mathematically, that adds in a new uh, shift in the phase of one of our waves here. And in our intensity calculation that we did on the last slide, that phase shift appears. In each term along with the angle. So again, you don't have to copy all this down. We're really only going to be using the results, but it's a lot of trig identities, trig Euler's identity to kind of simplify things down. So what we see is that the intensity in this case is the formula we had on the last slide, except we'll see the intensity, this intensity at any given point on the screen is going to depend by this overall on this overall phase shift. So as you change the path length of one of the beams, you should see the fringes at every position change. And what you see is essentially this. If you uh, delay one of the beams, the fringes shift to one side. They all kind of move. So hopefully that, see that again. So we delay beam K2 and all the fringes shift upward. So this experimental fact is what Michelson and Morley were actually trying to measure. So they were hoping to see that the speed of light would be different along one path of the, of the interferometer versus the other. And effectively, that change in speed would act like this slowing down of one of the pulses. So what they were hoping to see was the fringes shift in one direction like this. Uh, but this is why they expected to see that fringe shift. Fringe shift because this phase delay ends up appearing in our formula for the intensity. Uh, as you guys know, the end of this story, they did not see this fringe shift, which said that the, which they were allowed them to say that the speed of light is the same in all different reference frames, uh, which kind of led into the experimental proof of relativity. But this is the optical theory behind that experiment. How they did this experimentally to throw these beams off by a small different angle was just to slightly shift each mirror. So the mirrors are thrown off just a bit so that the beams cross and then just hit at a screen slightly after that crossing point. They hit at an angle and it gives us this spatial fringe pattern. And these are what we would call fringes in position rather than delay. So then they could take, for instance, a photograph of this fringe graph the intensity versus position X on the screen and see bright and dark fringes. Then by delaying one of those beams relative to the other, they see the fringes shift like, or they hope to see the fringes shift like so. So by using this interferometer, not only can we use it to measure the wavelength of light, but if we introduce this small angle between the beams, it allows us to measure very small phase shifts as well by easily just looking at a fringe pattern on the screen and seeing it move. Uh, for those of you that haven't taken advanced lab yet, you will do this experiment with a, uh, when you do take advanced lab with an interferometer we have in the department. So from here, that's all, it's a lot of theory for today, 
And we're may basically only going to be using the results from here on out. So if you have, want to hang out and you have questions about any of this theory, I'm happy to answer it. But tomorrow at 1.30, we'll go through the applications of the interferometer and how we use these results. In particular, we'll go through Michelson Morley's famous experiment and how this all applies to it. So if, there, if you don't have any questions, we're done for today. Uh, there are no problems for this particular lecture, but after Tuesday's lecture, I'll have a few problems for you. They will be due uh, not, not this coming Monday, but the Monday, or not this coming Friday, but the Friday after. All right, thank you, everyone.